Welcome to Bright Ideas TV. I'm Heather Wetzler. And I'm Bob Resselman. Each week, we focus on the thinking and people behind bright, imaginative ideas that make a real difference in the way the world works. Who's this week's guest, Bob? This week's guest is Elliot Sharp. And Elliot Sharp is a American multi-instrumentalist, composer, performer, and musical philosopher, and he's going to talk about his bright idea, which is new strategies for graphic notation. But before we start, we have to do something, don't we, Heather? We do. We have to introduce our sponsor. Yay! <laughs> bright Ideas TV is brought to you this week by DevOps.com. DevOps.com is the premier website for content and ideas Amount, um, around modern DevOps. DevOps.com is where the world meets DevOps. Wow, that's really good. And yeah, everybody should go to DevOps.com. They're our friends and they're our heroes. Anyway, let me introduce Elliot Sharp. Jazz Archives has named Elliot Sharp a central figure in the avant-garde and experimental music scene in New York City for over 30 years. He's released over 85 recordings, ranging from orchestral music to blues, jazz, noise, no wave, and techno music. He leads the projects Carbon and Orchestra Carbon, Tectonics, and Terraplane, and he's pioneered ways for applying fractal geometry, chaos theory, and genetic metaphors to musical composition and interaction. His collaborators have included Radio Symphonia Frankfurt, the pop singer Debbie Harry, Ensemble Modern, the Chrono String Quartet, Ensemble Resonance, Blues Regions, Hubert Sumlin and Pop Staples, and jazz greats Cecil Taylor and Sonny Chirac. Sharp has composed scores for feature films and documentaries. His work has appeared on the Sundance Channel, MTV, Bravo Networks, and he's presented numerous sound installations in art galleries and museums. He is the subject of a new documentary, Doing the Don't, by filmmaker Burke Shapiro. And he was the recipient of the Berlin Prize for 2015 and a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2014. As I said earlier, today Elliot's going to talk about his bright idea, new strategies for graphic notations. But before I bring him in, Heather, what I want to do is I want to play an excerpt from his piece, Mare Udarnum. So... Bear with me a minute while I uh, bring it up and I need to go, hold on. We gotta get to Tech Mastered, Heather, okay? But here we go. I'm gonna play Mari Udarnam. <laughs> So Heather, please join me in welcoming Elliot Sharp to Bright Ideas TV. Hey, Elliot. Hi, Heather. So, Hello. hey, how you doing? So Elliot, let's start at the beginning, okay? What is your idea and how did it come about? Well, this particular idea, and I can't really say if it changed the world, it changed a very small corner of the world, was to find a way to translate visual, uh, visual ideas into music notation 
and vice versa. The way I believe creativity works is that it starts from a central place in each of us. And to manifest an idea means to find the proper frequency bands to output it. Maybe it means picking up a guitar, maybe it means writing some music, maybe it means cooking a meal or taking a walk. But in this particular instance, I was finding, trying to find a way to translate certain sound ideas I had for musicians that aren't traditional ideas. They weren't the typical thing of here's a note on a staff, which means the musician fingers their instrument in a certain way and produces a particular sound. This is much more open-ended, much more porous, much more uh, freely moving between parts of the spectrum. So it's a question of changing an abstract notion of music, which is what music notation is in the traditional form, to something that's more visual, that can stimulate a part of the brain that is not necessarily linear. You want to find the oblique responses from the musicians and get them to react viscerally to what they're seeing on the score, whether it's printed on paper or projected in the case of these graphic scores. They can be animated as a movie or printed as one would look at any score. That's, that's an interesting idea. So the first thing that comes to mind as we discuss this is the notion of music as code. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go back before there was radio and uh, television and we could electronically reproduce music. What we had, the only thing, way we had to reproduce a piece of music was to put a score in front of a piano player and say, here it is, okay? And, and as we know in the late, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, music publishing was, was really the record labels of that time. That's how people made a fortune. So, right. so what, what, what I'm hear, hearing you say is that we're no longer looking at musical notation as an expression of re code to, be re to replicate an experience every no, time. This is a different kind of code. It has more to do with algorithms, okay. more the idea of an instruction set. Now an algorithm, I mean, a, a, a simple musical notation is an algorithm. Mm -hmm. Black dot on this line means the note C. Right. But in this case, I'm saying this image evokes certain visceral feelings that are more open-ended. So you can't say it's one particular output. There, the correspondence is not linear. The correspondence is this algorithm is a trigger for another type of process that's much more wide ranging and less defined, but relies more on the individual creativity of the interpreters. You know, I call orchestra players protein robots. Right, you right, know, right, right, right. The right. ideal orchestra player is like a MIDI output. You right. actually press this button right. and the note comes out, you know. This is a much more, it's a creative interaction with the players, you know. Right. Oh, no, that, that's a great idea because one of the things I'm liking about what you're saying is like you're saying, traditionally, particularly in orchestras, the, the, the role of the musician has been to be fairly robotic, right? There's not a lot of choice. You get some, but you don't get a lot of choice or not even choice. Let's just go uh, un, unconscious expression. You they don't want choice. Right. They don't want choice. They, they want, want to punch in. Yeah. Punch yeah. In the, right. So, th so this notion then, so let me just ask you about the mechanics. So do you actually, well, you explain to me, what, what is the performance experience like using this type of, um, of graphical notation? Do you, give the, do you give the score beforehand? It, it depends on the musicians. Some musicians I've worked very closely with, the musicians in my group, Sysort, where we've per performed these pieces many times, or Sysorc is actually a free-floating ensemble dependent on where I am. There's a Sysorc in Tokyo, Sysorc in Zurich, you know, Berlin, wherever. But the musicians have developed an interactive language between each other and myself and the visuals. I usually don't tell them what I want. I like them to interpret it. However, I do workshops. I might spend a week in a place working with musicians and develop the ideas because for some it's very alien. They might see what looks like a bunch of noise on a piece of paper and they say, well, how do I interpret it? I say, well, you've seen what a sine wave looks like on a screen. You've seen what music looks like in editing software. And this is why younger musicians are much more open to this because they're much more familiar 
with the process of how sound is visualized from you know the various apps that they use from, from everything really. So it's not that great a leap. Do you have any workshops coming up soon? Uh, let me think if I do. No, no, I'm right in the middle of composing an opera for September in Bochum, Germany. And that's in a way much more traditional that's going to be notes written down on pieces of paper and, and uh, the singers and the instrumentalists will be playing them. There'll be places where they're interpreting, but I'm not using this type of notation in this piece. So I, I, I feel I'm, I'm enjoying this conversation a great deal and it's, 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 it's inspiring. So I feel compelled to ask the uh, question. Uh, uh, I asked Leroy Jenkins a while ago and I said, cause I was listening to Leroy and I was listening to the revolutionary ensemble at the time. And it took me a while to figure it out and I'm still not quite sure I have. But the question I asked Leroy is I said, Leroy, do you ever play wrong notes? Mm -hmm. And his response to me was, no, there are no such thing as a wrong note. Yeah. So, which leads me to wonder then, and, and this might be beyond the scope of this discussion, but how do you maintain compositional identity? Well, the identity is there in the score. You know, if people, now a, a piece like Mon Mario and Dharam, mm -hmm. there are four systems, and we might agree that each system will be two minutes or each system will be 10 minutes. So right there, you have everybody corresponding to a clock. Mm -hmm. And the the as they divide up the system into minutes, the musicians have a certain um, shared notion of what is happening at this particular time. There's a certain density, there's a certain visual uh, presentation. At minute four, they're all seeing the same thing, ideally. Right, that's great. So what I'm hearing you say then is that the, the identity of the piece, in particular, Luca and Mari Dami, and excuse me that I'm not getting it right, my, my Italian's not very good, is the, the boundary, the identity is the boundary of time. Yeah, and the visuals. You know, you yes. can't separate what they're seeing from the window of time. But there are other pieces. Now I have a piece called Foliage, which started out as 250 individual sheets. I've been reading uh, some Walt Whitman actually, Leaves of Grass, and I was working, and this was an early version of this graphic process I'm using, and I took, I was trying to uh, design this piece for this ensemble performance, and I took, sitting on the couch 3 a.m., where a lot of ideas, so bright ideas especially, <laughs> come up, and uh, output one, a page of one of my scores into Photoshop, and that's how this whole process came about. Actually, it first began in 2007 with a piece called Seize, 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 Scene, real tongue twister. And I put this page into Photoshop, and I've always loved Photoshop. I've always dabbled with visuals. You know, I, I loved painting as a kid, and began to apply the same processes to this page that I was doing when I was mixing audio. I was doing a lot of live processing. I'd assemble a group of musicians, have them mic to go into a mixing desk, it would go into my laptop, maybe I'd bring up some hardware processors, maybe I'd modulate them with sine waves, I'd filter them, I'd make loops, I'd layer the sounds. I got tired of hearing the sound from the speakers. I felt that acoustic instruments were much more direct. There was much more emotional quality in those initial transient sounds that were just appearing from the vibration of a string or uh, uh, the membrane of a drum or a reed in space, nothing inter intermediated by speakers or wires or electronics. So I was saying, how can I get the same effects that I'm hearing? Because you can do great things with electronics. I mean, you can really, I mean, I grew up in the psychedelic era, you know, and to be able to create distortion was the best thing you could do, you know? and I realized that in Photoshop, I had a lot of the same tools. I could modulate with the Waves plugins. I could filter, I could reverse, I could invert. So I took my score and did the same process to it. And what I got out was something that appealed to me very much visually and also appealed to me as an interpreter of sound. And I gave it to the musicians at a string quartet rehearsal. I gave it to them, I said, play this. And Great. they did. Great. Great. And, and that's so, no, this is inspiring. And the reason I'm, I'm preempting you because I do want to mention your upcoming book. Yes. Uh, you have a book coming. What is the book and when can we buy it? It's called Irrational Music. Okay. And that's on, of course, the ear and rational. So it is really about the rational 
view of how the ear works. But overall, for me, is the irrational, the spontaneous, the thing that happens that you can't predict. I like nonlinear systems. And the book is often about that, you know, what happens when you work with irrational numbers or Fibonacci series or fractal geometry or things that can't be defined in any particular way, you know, the thing that is completely the, the ineffable. Great. So, okay, I, what we'll do, I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to buy the book and I November it, first. And we'll put it and uh, I'll put a link to where they can get it, but can you just mention where we can buy it? I, it will be, I guess, available wherever books are sold these Where's days. Sold? Okay, <laughs> Amazon. Go to Amazon. Yeah, yeah well, or, or, right. or wherever. I mean, your local bookstore, if you have such a thing, that's the best. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I like physical books, you know. I yeah. like Right. Well, we can know, start a bookstore. We can start the, you know, the Elliot Chart bookstore and we'll just... Well, yeah. think about the East Village where my studio is. There are still a number of great bookstores, you know, not as many as there used to be. Yeah. There are a few. So... Our time is coming to a close. Uh, this is amazing. This was a really good, um, really good episode. Really good episode. I find it inspiring and educational. So uh, is there anything, are we going to come back next week, Heather? We are going to come back and we should probably tease the audience to, so they come back too. Because I believe next week, Bob, we have yes. Bill Farrell. Yes, we do have Bill Farrow, and Bill Farrow is going to share his idea, Hello Works. And what Hello Works is, they're, they're working on a way to deal with documents, to make the document viewing and editing and authentication process a lot easier for mobile devices, particularly cell phones, because there's just a lot more documentation authentication going on. And by that, I mean contract signing and smart contracts and stuff like that. And he's going to talk about his idea about how to just make documents work better on cell phones. So there you have it. And we'll be back next week. We're going to be broadcasting at uh, 3, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Central. And so Eastern. Right. Thank you again. And that's why you're here, Heather, because you, you figured all this stuff out where I'm just not very good at it. So I'm going to say, see, Elliot, thanks for coming by. Heather, I'll see you next week. That's the truth. Thank you. And I'm Heather Wetzler, and you've been watching Bright Ideas TV. Mm -hmm.